Well, welcome into the uh, tonight's show of Lessons of Vietnam. We're doing things a little different tonight. In case you haven't noticed, Amnon's in the studio on one side of town, and I'm in the, uh, at home speaking to you by Skype from another part of town. Uh, we did the show from Vietnam, so we ought to be all right with doing this one. Got a little storm in the background, so hope we don't get cut off or so forth. Uh, tonight's show is a continuation of our uh, Medal of Honor recipients. We're going to be talking about the different uh, recipients of the Medal of Honor uh, tonight, and eventually we're going to finish all of them. But uh, uh, tonight we've got uh, those who uh, qualified and received the uh, Medal of Honor. I believe most of them we've still been covering tonight, as well as the last uh, two shows, was been uh, posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, this is part three of the Medal of Honor. And as we're going to get started with our normal slide showing us to start with here, uh, with the Lessons of Vietnam show, I am your host, Bill Dixon, uh, Vietnam 1967-1968, during the uh, Tet Offensive of 68. We're being broadcast courtesy of Nissan Communications. Amnon is running the show back at uh, on the other side of Raleigh for uh, Nissan Communications. And here I am uh, talking to you from this way. Uh, any comments or suggestions that you might have, uh, contact me at DixonBill80 at Yahoo.com. I got a message from uh, a gentleman in Michigan. I think it was Michigan. Uh, running off my mind right now, but uh, he had sent me a message and it came back. And then he sent me, uh, he tracked me down by uh, and sent me a, and called me. So we talked for over an hour on the phone. But I think he said he couldn't get to me on uh, Yahoo, so uh, I have a feeling he might have missed the 8-0. But to participate in the show, you can still dial in at 919-518-9773 or by Skype. That's two com computers, 2K voice, and make a comment, ask, uh, ask a question, or whatever else you want to do uh, tonight. And uh, moving right along to the Veteran Crisis Line, you know, uh, we're in this little situation right now with a virus, and uh, we don't know exactly what's going on from one day to the next. We just take it one day at a time. But if you're already having problems being locked up at home uh, and with all the things that are going on can be very stressful, if you're a veteran or you know a veteran or you have a veteran in your family that's having uh, problems, uh, with the situation right now, call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1. You've got some good trained people there, uh, some veterans and so forth to talk and help you get through it. There's no need to uh, have extra problems during this time. Uh, on the Facebook, I have uh, seen a few people on my uh, Vietnam veteran sites, different ones, who are having a lot of stress problems. Being in the military, you're kind of used to being uh, sequestered and not having a whole lot of people to talk to. But uh, some of you out there get a little older. And uh, so moving right along to the next slide, we're going to be talking about the Medal of Honor, uh, the highest medal that the United States of America gives. Uh, it's the most prestigious uh, personal military decoration that may be awarded to recognize the U.S. military service. And you have to be in the service. Uh, the medal is normally awarded by the President of the United States in the name of the U.S. Congress. Because the medal is presented in the name of Congress, it is often referred to informally as the Congressional Medal of Honor. However, the official name of the current award is Medal of Honor. There have been 19 people awarded multiple Medal of Honors all prior to 1918, with which when stricter regulations were placed on awarding the medal. So that's kind of uh, uh, eliminate that. Now, as well, I'm giving you the name of a, a person, and I'm going to be mentioning uh, where they are on the wall, just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, the wall, uh, the to the right-hand wall, it starts in 1959, and it goes panels east, one, two, three, four, five, right on down to the line. And then it comes back all the way back to the other end, and starts all over from there, uh, West 1, West 2, West 3, to we end at 1975. So the wall ends, begins and ends at the same, at the same, uh, at the same apex. To the right hand side is your east panels, and to the left side is the west panels. Uh, some of 1968 
or will cover a good part of the east panels and some of the west panels. So that'll kind of give you an idea when I say they're on the wall at uh, east panels, uh, E1, uh, line 43, uh, and so forth. So that'll give you an idea as we're going along so you can relate to where they're on the wall. The first one we're going to be talking about is now, I'm going to remind you out there, uh, sometimes I have a great deal of problems uh, pronouncing uh, names and words uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, if you know the right uh, right pronunciation, get on the phone and call me and tell me, no, dummy, that's not the way it's done. I'd appreciate that. If you just leave out the word dummy, it'll be okay. Uh, but this guy's name is Laszlo Rebel. Uh, he was a staff sergeant. He was with the 7th Infantry, Infantry Detachment. Uh, he was a LERP which was the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. This means that he went out with a few other guys out into the jungles and looked for the bad guys, and they were always outnumbered just about wherever they went. He was with a headquarters, headquarters company, the 173rd Airborne, the United States Army Republic of Vietnam. Army, of course. He was from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He was born September 21st, 1990, 1939, and he, was, uh, he died November 13th, 1968. He is on the panel at West 38, Line 7. Uh, you can see the bottom left-hand corner of the screen there. Uh, Richard Nixon is uh, giving his wife and daughter or son, I can't tell from here, uh, the, uh, the medal. Uh, that's him in the medal picture, and that's him with his... Uh, uh, Green Beret hat or his LERP hat uh, on the on the right hand side. So uh, let's see what we got, how he won this medal. This is a medal citation. This is the one that's written up uh, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life and above beyond the call of duty. Staff Sergeant Rebel distinguished himself while serving as the leader of Team Delta 74th Infantry uh, Detachment at one, one, 1,100 hours uh, on this day, Team Delta was in a defensive perimeter conducting re reconnaissance of enemy trail networks when a number of the team defect detected enemy movement in the front. Now, you got to remember, they went out in small teams, and the idea was to not get found. Uh, but in this particular case, looks like they uh, were, were found. As Staff Sergeant Ravel and his comrade prepared to clear the area, he heard an incoming grenade as it landed in the midst of the team's perimeter. With complete disregard for his life, Staff Sergeant Ravel threw himself in the grade and covered it with his body, receiving a complete impact of the immediate explosion. Though his, through his indomitable courage, complete disregard for his safety and profound concern for his fellow soldier, Staff Sergeant Ravel averted the loss of injury and life to the other members of the team Delta. By his gallantry at the cost of his life, in the highest tradition of the military service, Staff Sergeant Ravel has reflected great credit upon himself and his unit in the United States Army. Okay. There is a picture of him uh, giving his child a uh, kiss. His tour of duty started 6-6-1966. Uh, the incident date was 11-13-1968. Uh, he must have uh, served two tours there. He was 29 years old. Uh, the casualty date and the incident date matches, which is that's not always the case. Uh, there is his uh, tombstone. Uh, Lazarus is buried in the Arlington National Cemetery, uh, plot section 52, grave 1326. And you can see it's kind of plain there as far as uh, just says his name, Medal of Honor, and the Staff Sergeant, and so forth. So that's uh, uh, Sergeant Laszlo, Rappel. Okay. Now let's talk about David, Ray, uh, Don, Ray, David Robert Ray, Petty Officer, Second Class. Okay. Now how in the world a Petty Officer get to be on the land in Vietnam? He ought to be out in the ocean somewhere. But no, not necessarily, because he was with Headquarters Battery, 2nd Battalion, 11th Marines, 1st Marine Division, and see, the Marines don't have their own corpsman. Uh, the Navy furnishes their corpsman. He is from McMinnville, Tennessee. He was born February 14, 1945, and he lost his life March 19, 1969. David R. Ray's on the wall panel, West 29, Line 82. Uh, you see him uh, there kind of relaxing his T-shirt. There he is, a younger 
uh, with the sailor suit on and then the, uh, the gravestone uh, there at the bottom, or you can see that uh, it does say that he had the Medal of Honor and so forth. Let's see what his citation had to say. On the night of 18, 19, 18th and 19th of March, both nights, 1969, Delta Battery, 2nd and 11th Marines were located at Fire Support Base Fulock 6, adjacent to Liberty Bridge near Anwa. A few hundred meters distance was the command post of the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. In the early morning hours of 19th of March, both areas were attacked first by a barrage of mortar and rocket fire, and then by a ground attack, estimated to be a battalion size. 13 Marines and two Navy corpsmen died in two attacks, 12 from Delta, 2nd of the 11th, and three from the, uh, from the 1st of the 5th uh, Command Post. But the NVA left 79 bodies strewn around the artillery compound alone. HM2 David R. Ray was formally assigned to the headquarters battery, but was Delta 2nd 11th Senior Corpsman. Okay. Next slide. This is his uh, citation for uh, the Medal of Honor. Uh, Hospital Corpsman, 2nd Class, United States Navy, for services set forth in the following. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as an HM2 with Battery D, 2nd Battalion at Fulock 6 near Anwa, during the early morning hours, an estimated battalion size enemy force launched a determined assault against the battery's position and succeeded in effecting a penetration of the barbed wire perimeter. The initial burst of enemy fire caused numerous casualties among the Marines who immediately manned their howitzers, or their big guns, during the rocket and mortar attack. Undaunted by the intense hostile fire, HM2 Ray moved from parapet to parapet, rendering emergency medical treatment to the wounded. Okay. Next slide. Although seriously wounded himself while administering first aid to a Marine casualty, he refused medical aid and continued his life-saving efforts. While he was bandaging and attempting to com com uh, comfort another wounded uh, Marine, HM2 Ray was forced to battle two enemy soldiers who attacked his position. Personally killing one and wounded in the other, rapidly losing his strength as a result of his severe wounds, he nonetheless managed to move through the hell of enemy fire to other casualties. Once again, he was forced with intense fire of un oncoming enemy troops and despite the grave personal danger and insurmountable odds, succeeded in treating the wounded and holding off the enemy until he ran out of ammunition in which he sustained fatal wounds. There's something about the medics and the corpsmen just, uh, uh, they just uh, got out there and gave everything they had and then pulled back and, and gave more. Uh, these guys are just phenomenal. H.M. Ray's final act of heroism was to protect the patient he was treating, threw himself upon the wounded Marine, thus saving the Marine's life when an enemy grenade exploded nearby. By his determined and persevering actions, courageous spirit and selfless devotion to the welfare of his Marine comrades, H.M. 2 Ray served to inspire the men of Battery D to heroic efforts in defeating the enemy. His conduct through throughout was in keeping with the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. His tour of duty started 7-12-1968. His incident date was 3-1969. He was 24 years old. He was in Guangdong Providence, and his body was recovered at the time. Thank you. Next one. Next young man. Okay. Milton Lee Olive III. Private First Class, he was with the 3rd Platoon, B Company, 2nd Battalion, the 503rd Infantry, part of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, uh, United States Army, Republic of Vietnam. He was from Chicago, Illinois, born November 7th, 1946, uh, died October 22nd, 1965. He's on the panel at 2E, line 131. Let's see, he was 1965. He was killed early on. That's you're looking at panel 2E is uh is pretty early on. Casualty date was uh started as 6565, and incident date was four months later. Uh 102265. He was 18 years old. 
uh, uh, Ben Duong Providence in South Vietnam. You can see him in his uh, airborne uh, jump outfit. And there he is. He does not look 18 at all. I guess as you get older. Let's, let's see what his citation says here. Next. Okay. Almost skip all that because you already know what that says about the president and so forth. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his uh, life and above beyond the call of duty, PFC Olive was a member of the 3rd Platoon of Company B as it moved through the jungle to find the Viet Cong operating the area. Although the platoon was subject, subjected to a heavy volume of enemy gunfire and pinned down temporarily, it retaliated by assaulting the Viet Cong position, causing the enemy to flee. The best way to get rid of, uh, of a, as an attack is to counterattack the attack. Okay, next slide, please. As the platoon pursued the insurgents, PFC Olive and four other soldiers were moving through the jungle together when a grenade was thrown into their midst. PSF Olive saw the grenade and then saved the lives of his fellow so soldiers at the sacrifice of his own by grabbing the grenade in his hands and falling out to absorb the blast with his body. Through his bravery, unhesitating actions, and complete disregard for his safety, he prevented additional loss of life or injury to the members of his platoon. PSC Olive's extraordinary heroism at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty or in the highest tradition of the United States Army and reflect great credit upon himself and the armed forces of his country. Company, company 2, 503rd Infantry lost two men on the 22nd of October, 1965. PSC Olive and Spec 4, George G. Lewis of Pahu, Hawaii. Okay, next one, please. Now, several of the guys we've just talked about, got, talked about were all jumped on a grenade or, or, or sacrificed themselves. And, you know, that takes a special person to do that, to make sure that uh, his buddies survive. I, I, I guess you don't have time to think about it, you just react, but he reacted to, uh, all these guys reacted to uh, the saving their buddies around them and so forth, and uh, that's what you fight for when you're out uh, like that. Kenneth Lee Olson, he was a spec four. Uh, A Company, 5th Battalion, 12th Infantry, 199th Infantry Brigade, uh, he's from Painesville, Minnesota. He was born May 26, 1945 to May 13, 1968. He's on the panel 59E and line 28. Just before you get ready to swing back over to the west side. His casual date was 4-1-1968. Uh, and his casualty date was 5-13-1968. What's that, 12 days? Age 22, location, did in Providence. His body was recovered. Now let's see what the citation has to say. That's his picture there. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in actions at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Special Olson distinguished himself in the, at the cost of his life while serving as a team leader with the a, Company A, Specialist Olson was participating in a mission to reinforce a reconnaissance platoon, which was heavily engaged with a well-entrenched Viet Cong force. When his platoon moved in the area of contact and had, had overrun the first line of enemy bunkers, Specialist Olson and a fellow soldier moved forward to the platoon to investigate another suspected line of bunkers. As the two men advanced, they were pinned down by an intense automo automatic weapon fire from an enemy position 10 meters to the front. With complete disregard for his safety, Specialist Olson exposed himself and hurled a hand grenade into the Viet Cong position. Next slide. Failing to silence the hostile fire, he again exposed himself to the intense fire in preparation to assault the enemy position. As he prepared to hurl the grenade, he was this was a second grenade, he was wounded, causing him to drop the activated device or grenade within his own position. Realizing that it would explode immediately, Specialist Olson threw himself upon the grenade and pulled it into his body to take full force of the explosion. He was killed by his own grenade, but he wanted to make sure that his buddies uh, survived. By this unselfish action, Specialist Olson sacrificed his own life to save the lives of his fellow comrades in arms. 
His extraordinary heroism inspired his fellow soldiers to renew their effort and totally defeat the enemy force. Specialist Olson's profound courage and intrepidity were in keeping with the high tradition of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. Okay. Next slide. David George. Okay. I'm not even certain I want to even try to pronounce this one. Let's see. Uh, David, I owe it to you to give you a try. David George Ulett. Was a seaman, PBR, which is Brown uh, uh, Patrol Boat River, uh, the, the uh, Brown Water Navy man. It was uh, kind of a flat bottom boat uh, with a uh, with used jets uh, from Wellesley, Massachusetts, uh, June 1944 to March 6, 1967. He's on the panel 16E, line 30. Now the USS Ulett. The 26th Knox class frigate was commissioned on December 12, 1970, and served until decommissioned on August 6, 1993. You can see his picture there as a sailor, but then you can see down there that the ship that was actually named after him for the, his deeds and so forth. Uh, the ship uh, USS Ulett, uh, so forth. Next slide. The citation says, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life, above and beyond the call of duty while serving with River Section 532 in combat against the enemy in the Republic of Vietnam as a forward machine gunner on a river patrol boat, PBR 124, which was on patrol on the Mekong River during the early evening hours of 6 March 1967, Seaman Ulick observes suspicious activity near the riverbank, alerted his boat captain and recommended movement of the boat to the area to investigate. When the PBR was making a high-speed run along the riverbank, Seaman Ulett spotted an incoming enemy grenade falling towards, the, falling towards the boat. Must have been from a grenade launcher. Okay, next slide. He immediately left the protection protected position of his gun mount and ran aft the full length of the speeding boat, shouting to his fellow crew members to take cover. Observing the boat captain standing unprotected on the boat, Simon Allett bounded into the engine compartment cover and pushed the boat captain down to the safety. In the split second that followed the grenade's landing and in the face of certain death, Simon Allett fearlessly placed himself between the deadly missile and his shipmates courageously absorbing most of the blast fragments with his own body in order to protect his shipmates from injury and death. His extraordinary heroism and selfishness and courageous actions on behalf of his comrades at the expense of his own life were in the finest tradition of the United States Naval Service. Next slide. You can see his, his uh, headstone there or a plaque. Uh, casual date, We've, uh, he was 22 years old. Uh, Gokong Providence, not quite certain where that is. Uh, body was recovered, 3 6 1967. Okay, the next slide. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, Joe Calvin Paul, who was a Lance Corporal, uh, H Company, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, 3rd Marine Division, uh, United States Marine Corps from Dayton, Ohio, April 23rd, 1946 to August 19th, 1965. He was early on. Uh, Joe C. Paul is on panel 2E in line 63. And you can see a memorial there for him in the left, his picture there, uh, young man. Uh, his incident date was 8-18-1965. Uh, you notice the casual date was 8-19-1965. Uh, evidently it took him, and the body was recovered, so it took him a day to get back to get the body. Age of loss was 19. Um, that was the date he was declared dead. Uh, Kwong Na Providence. Okay, now let's look at the uh, citation. Next slide. Citation. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty in violent battle, what other kind is there? Lance Corporal Paul's platoon sustained five casualties that was temporarily pinned down by the devastating war 
recoilless rifle, automatic weapons, and rifle fire delivered by insurgent communist Viet Cong forces in a well-entrenched position. Next slide. The wounded Marines were unable to move from their perilously exposed position forward of the remainder of their platoon and were suddenly subjected to a barrage of white phosphorus rifle grenades. White phosphorus burns and uh, it burns bad, and if it hits you on your skin, it will burn all the way through. Don't, so uh, that was coming in by rifle grenades. Lance Corporal Paul, fully aware that his tactics would almost certainly result in serious injury or death to himself, choose disregard his safety and boldly dash across the fire swept rice paddies, placing himself between his wounded comrades and the enemy and delivered effective suppressive fire with his automatic weapon in order to divert the attack long enough to fellow casualties to be evacuated. So it was a, kind of an a, a initial fight, uh, a ambush. The guys that were dropped back a little bit, that's all right, uh, dropped back a little bit, and he um, uh, went out and got between them so they could go back and get them again. The second Marines, okay, although, back one. Back one slide, name on. Although quickly wounded during the course of battle, he resolutely, resolutely remained in his exposed position and continued to fire his rifle until he collapsed and was evacuated. By his fortitude and gallant spirit of self-sacrifice in the face of his almost certain death, he saved the lives of some of his fellow Marines. His heroic actions served to inspire all who observed him and reflect the highest credit upon himself, the Marine Corps, and the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life in the cause of freedom. Next slide. The 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, 2nd to 4th, arrived in July and May 1965. But initial contact with any was minimal. Operation Starlight, the first regimental-sized battle for American forces since the Korean War and the first major engagement for the 2nd to 4th was an assault against the 1st Viet Cong Regiment's position at Van Thuong uh, Peninsula, 15 miles south of Tula Airstrip. Okay, the three Marine Battalion, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, and 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, and supporting units were involved. On 18 August 1965, Mike 33rd approached the area on foot. While the remaining forces were landed by amphibious and Helleborn Assault Hotel, 2nd to 4th, uh, was landed in the middle of the Viet Cong 50th Battalion's position and immediately surrounded. Two miles north of India's 3rd or 3rd was heavily engaged by another VC battalion. Uh, they can't land it in a, uh, right in the middle of all of them. On 18th of August, uh, 18th of August, and it cost the lives of 45 sailors and Marines, but set the stage decisively defeating the 1st VC Regiment, killing 614 Viet Cong. Hotel 2nd and 4th lost 16 men as a dull day's fighting. Gunny Sergeant Albert R. Rate from New Jersey, Staff Sergeant James A. Smith, Warsaw, Kentucky, Sergeant Jerry D. Tharp, Kemp, Texas, Sergeant Peter C. Town, Morris, Connecticut, Corporal William W. Nickerson, Sarasota, Florida, Lance Corporal R. Brooks from Anderson, South Carolina, Lance Corporal James P. DeWitt from Florida, Colorado, Lance Corporal Eddie L. Landry Gonzalez, uh, Gonzalez, uh, Louisiana, and he received the Silver Star. And we just talked about Lance Corporal uh, Paul uh, from Dayton, Ohio. Uh, he received the Medal of Honor. So uh, that was what the price they paid that day. Next slide. Okay, we've got some more here. Same battle. Lance Corporal Michael C. Short for Canaga Park, California. Lance Corporal Kenneth D. Stankiewicz, Buffalo, New York, also received the Silver Star. PSC Bruce J. Henrik from Detroit, Michigan. PSC Henry C. Jordan, New York, New York. PSC Harry L. Koss, Dunkirk, New York, also received the Silver Star. PSC James H. Sawyer. Morgantown, West Virginia, and PSC John B. Tett from Rochester, New York. That was a lot of men and a lot of medals there. A Knox-class destroyer escort, the USS Paul, 
DE 1080 was named for Lance Corporal Joe Calvin Paul. Paul's kill was laid 12 September 1969 at Avondale Shipyards in West Wigo, Louisiana. She was christened and launched 20th of June 1970 and was commissioned 14th of August 1971 at Boston Shipyard. Next slide. And there it is. In the latter part of 1972, the Paul departed the United States for the West Pacific and arrived off the coast of Republic of Vietnam on 23 November, where she immediately went into action in support of ground troops ashore. One of Paul's first guns, uh, gunfire support missions was at Chulai, where Lance Corporal Joe C. Paul, for whom the ship was named, died on 19th of August, 1965, from wounds received in battle on, on 18th of August while participating in Operation Skylight, Starlight. That's awesome. He was such a soldier, they uh, named the ship after him, and the ship went back, and, and the first action was firing uh, right back to where he was. Uh, next one is Gary Wayne Martini. Private First Class, F Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, 1st Marine Division, United States Marine Corps from Portland, Oregon. And he was born September 21st, 1948, and his casual date was, April 21st, 1967. He is on a panel 18E, line 61. His casual date was uh, 421.67. He was in Quang Nam Providence, South Vietnam, and they did receive the body. You can see the young man there and his medal with his uh, mar grave marker. And let's see what his citation had to say. For well, conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a rifleman, Company F, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, 1st Marine Division in the Republic of, uh, of Vietnam on 21 April 1967 during Operation Union. Elements of Company F conducting offensive operations at Ben Sun encountered a firmly entrenched enemy force and immediately deployed to engage them. The Marines in Private Martin's, Martini's platoon assaulted across an open rice paddy to within 20 meters of the enemy trench line, which were suddenly struck by hand grenades, intense small arms and automatic weapons, and mortar fire. They want a whole lot for them to hide behind as they were running across the uh, rice paddies there. The enemy onslaught killed 14 and wounded 18 Marines, pinning the remainder of the platoon down behind a low petty dike. And they are real low. Uh, in the face of imminent danger, Private Martini immediately crawled over the dike to a forward uh, open area within 15 meters of the enemy position, were continuously exposed to the hostile fire he hurled gr hand grenades, killing several of the enemy. Crawling back through the intense fire, he rejoined his platoon which had moved to the relatively safety of a trench line. From this position, he observed several of his wounded comrades lying helplessly in the fire-swept paddy. Although he knew that one man had been killed attempting to assist the wounded, Private Martini raced through the open area and dragged a comrade back to the friendly position in spite of a serious wound received during the first daring rescue. He again braved the unrelenting fury of the enemy fire to aid another companion lying wounded only 20 meters in front of the enemy trench line. Next slide. As he reached the fallen Marine, he received a moral wound, but disregarding his own condition, he began to drag the Marine towards the position. Observing men from his unit attempting to leave the security of the position to aid him, concerned only for their safety, he called to them to remain undercover and through a final supreme effort, moved his injured comrade to where he could be pulled to safely before he fell, succumbing to his wounds. Stout-hearted and indomitable, Private Martini unhesitantly yielded his own life to save two of his comrades and ensure the safety of the remainder of his platoon. His outstanding courage, valiant fighting spirit, and his selfish devotion to duty reflected the highest credit upon himself, the Marine Corps, and United States Naval Services. He gallantly gave his life for his country, by, signed by Lyndon Baines Johnson. Now, it's amazing these people, uh, these men out here that we're talking about, 
they're not supermen. They, but they go so far beyond. It's, it's just amazing uh, what they're doing, their termination. His legacy, Martini Hall, building 622 at the Marine Corps Recruiting Depot, depot uh, at uh, San Diego, is named in honor of Martini, who completed his recruit training in, uh, at San Francisco, at San Diego in 1966. Martini Hall at Camp Honoro in Camp Pendleton, California, is a chow hall named in honor of Martini. Gary Wayne Martini Memorial Bridge at the intersection of I-64 and Route 219 in Lewisburg, West Virginia, is named in his honor. So hopefully he will always be remembered. The next young man we're talking about uh, is uh, Larry Leonard Maxim. Max, am I? I'm just uh, D Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, 3rd Marine Division uh, from Glendale, California. Uh, born January 9th, 1948. Uh, casualty date was February 2nd, 1968. Uh, Larry uh, Maxim is on the panel at 36E, line 78. The casualty date, he started his tour 720, 1967. The casualty date and incident date are the same, 2-2-1968. Two, two, he was 20 years old in Quang Tree, Providence. Um, uh, Guantan Tree Province has got some of the uh, most bombs of any place in the history of warfare. Uh, of course, his body was recovered. You can see him there in his uniform, and you can see him there as a young man in, in civilian clothes. Uh, he was definitely uh, a very young man to have lost his life. The citation reads, uh, The President of the United States of America, in the name of Congress, takes pride in presenting the Medal of Honor posthumously to Corporal Larry Leonard Maxim, United States Marine Corps for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty on 2 February 1968. While serving as a fire team leader with Company D, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, 3rd Marine Division, reinforced Fleet Marine Force in actions against enemy forces in the Camelo District of Quang Tri Province, Republic of Vietnam, the Camelo District headquarters came under extreme heavy rocket artillery, mortars, and recordless rifle fire from a numerically superior enemy force, destroying a portion of the offensive perimeter. Next slide. Corporal Latham, observing the enemy massing for an assault into the compound across the remaining defensive wire, instructed his assistant fire team leader to take charge of the fire team and unhesitatingly proceeded to the weakened section of the perimeter completely exposed to the concentrated enemy fire, he sustained multiple fragmentation wounds from exploding grenades as he ran into an abandoned machine gun position. Reaching the emplacement, he grasped the machine gun and commenced to deliver effective fire on the advancing enemy. As the enemy directed maximum firepower against the determined Marine, Cobra Maxim's position received a direct hit from a rocket-propelled grenade, knocking him backwards and inflicting severe fragmentation wounds to his face and right eye. Next slide. Although momentarily stunned and in intense pain, Corporal Maxim courageously resumed his firing position and subsequently was struck again by small arms fire. With resolute determination, he gallantly continued to deliver intense machine fire, causing the enemy to retreat through the fence wire to position of cover. In a desperate attempt to silence his weapon, the North Vietnamese threw hand grenades and directed recordless rifles fire against him, inflicting two additional wounds. Too weak to reload his machine gun, Corporal Maxima fell to a prone position and Valent continued to deliver effective fire with his rifle. The man was not going to give up. After one and a half hours during which he was hit repeatedly by fragments from exploding grenades and concentrated small enemy fire, he succumbed to his wounds. Having successfully defended nearly half the perimeter single-handedly, Corporal Maxim's aggressive fighting spirit, inspiring valor, and selfish devotion to duty reflected a great credit upon himself and the Marine Corps and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country, presented to his family at the White House by President Richard M. Nixon on April 20, 1970. It's amazing, the people out there just uh, just walk in the streets uh, and do such just things. Um, makes you proud to be an American. 
an American soldier. Philip G. McDonald. Uh, you can see him uh, in his picture there in his uniform. Uh, there they are. Looks like he's reading a hometown newspaper and in his head uh, the, uh, the plaque. He's from Greensboro, North Carolina. He is, uh, was born September 23rd, 1941, and the incident date was 7, 1968. He's on the West Panel 59, line 26. Okay. Next, next slide, please. Okay, let's see if I can skip down on through all uh, uh, that. First class, uh, private first class, Gene McDonald. United States Army for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a team leader with the 1st Platoon, Company A, 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry Regiment, 4th Infantry Division in action against enemy aggressors forced forces in Kantum City, Republic of Vietnam, on 7 June 1968. While on a combat mission, Private First Class McDonald's platoon came under a heavy barrage automatic weapons fire from a well-concealed company-sized enemy force. Volunteering to escort two wounded comrades to an evacuation point, PFC McDonald crawled through intense fire to destroy it which, with a grenade and enemy automatic weapon threatening the safety of the evacuation. Next slide. Returning to his platoon, he again volunteered to provide covering fire for the maneuver of the platoon from its exposed position, realizing the threat he posed, enemy gunners concentrated their fire on Private First Class McDonald's position, seriously wounding him. Despite his painful wounds, Private First Class recovered the weapon of a wounded machine gunner to provide accurate covering fire to the gunner's evacuation when other soldiers were pinned down by heavy volumes of fire from a hostile machine gun to his front. Private First Class McDonald crawled towards the enemy position to destroy it with a grenade. He was mortally wounded in his intrepid action. Private First Class McDonald's gallantry at the risk of his life, which resulted in saving the lives of his comrades, is in keeping with the highest tradition of the United States military service and reflects great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. His casual date, he was 26 years old, Gontum, Providence, uh, 6-7, 1968. As you can see, he started his tour in 68. Uh, he was there uh, three months, a little less than three months. Next slide, please. Ray McGibbon, Sergeant, B Troop, 7th Squadron, 17th Cavalry, 1st Aviation Brigade, Cedartown, Georgia, born October 27, 1945. Uh, incident day or casual date was 6, 1968. You can see him there with his helmet. You see him there with his dress uniform and his Medal of Honor. He started his tour February 5th, 1967, and getting very close to coming home. He was 23 years old. The casual date was uh, December 6th, 1968. At 10 months in, in two months, he'd have been uh, coming home. Uh, as a citation, please. The President of the United States, in the name of Congress, takes pride in presenting the Medal of Honor, posthumously, to Sergeant Ray McKibben, the United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, while serving as a team leader of the point element of a reconnaissance patrol of Troop B, 7th Squadron, Air Mobile, 7th Cavalry Regiment, 1st Aviation Brigade, in action against enemy aggressors, forces, operating in enemy territory near Song Mao, Republic of Vietnam, on 8th December 1968. Sergeant McGibbon was leading his point element in a movement to contact along, to contact along a well-traveled trail when the lead element came under heavy automatic weapons fire from a fortified bunker position, forcing the patrol to take cover. Next slide. Sergeant McKibben, appraising the situation without regard for his own safety, charged through bamboo and heavy brush to the fortified position, killing the enemy gunner, secured the weapon, and then directed patrol elements forward. As the patrol moved out, Sergeant McGibbon observed any movements to the flank of his patrol. Fire support from helicopter gunships was requested, and the air was effectively neutralized. 
patrol again, continued its mission, and as the lead element rounded the bend of a river, it came under heavy automatic weapons fire from camouflage bunkers. As Sergeant McGibbon was deployed his men to cover positions, he observed one of his men fall wounded. Although bullets were hitting all around the wounded man, Sergeant McGibbon, with complete disregard for his safety, sprang to his comrade's side and under heavy enemy fire, pulled him to safety behind the cover of a rock in placement where he administered hasty first aid. Next slide, please. Sergeant McGibbon, seeing that his comrades were pinned down and were unable to deliver effective fire against the enemy bunkers, again undertook a single-handed assault of the enemy defense. He charged through the brush and hail of gun, uh, automatic weapon fire, closing on the enemy's first bunker, killing the enemy with an accurate rifle fire and securing the enemy's weapon. He again continued his assault against the next bunker, firing his rifle as he charged. As he approached the second bunker, which was actually the third, uh, he, he wiped out, his rifle ran out of ammunition. However, he used the captured enemy weapon until it too was empty. At that time, he silenced the bunker with well-placed hand grenades. He relocated his weapon, not relocated, he reloaded his weapon and covered the advance of his men as they moved forward. Observing the fire of another bunker impeding the patrol's advance, Sergeant McGibbon again single-handed assaulted the new position. Next slide. As he neared the bunker, he was mortally wounded, was able to fire a final burst from his weapon, killing the enemy and enabling the patrol to continue the assault. Sergeant McGibbon's indomitable courage, extraordinary heroism, profound concern for the welfare of his fellow soldiers and disregard for his personal safety and save the lives of his comrades and enable the patrol to accomplish this mission. Sergeant McGibbon's gallantry in action at the cost of his life above and beyond the call of duty or in the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. Next slide. Okay, uh, next uh, young man, uh, sometimes they seem to be getting younger. Uh, Thomas Joseph McMahon, Spec 4, Headquarters, Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry, 196th Infantry Brigade, uh, part of the Americal Division uh, from Lewiston, Maine, born June 4, 24, 1948, date of casualty, March 19th, 1969, Kwong Providence. He was 20 years old. Let's see, he was there uh, 1014 to 1068. So he was there 319, 1969. You see his, uh, his plaque there. Citation says, Specialist 4th Class Thomas Joseph McMahon, United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, while serving as an aid man with Company A, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry Regiment, 196th Infantry Brigade, America Division, in action against enemy aggressors, forces at Quang Tinh Province, Republic of Vietnam, on 18th of March, 1969, when the lead element of his company came under heavy fire from well-fortified enemy positions. Three soldiers fell seriously wounded. Spec 4 class, Spec 4 McMahon, when completed with regard for his own safety, left his covered position and ran through intense enemy fire to the side of one of the wounded and enlisted first aid and then carried him to safety. Next slide. He returned through the hell of fire to the side of a second wounded man, although painfully wounded by an exploding mortar around, around which while returning the wounded man to, to a secure position, Spec 4 Mahan refused medical attention and heroically ran back through the heavy enemy fire towards the remaining wounded comrades. He fell mortally wounded before he could rescue the last man. Spec 4 McMahon Undaunted concern for the welfare of his comrades at the cost of his life or in keeping with the highest tradition of the United States military of the military service and in great reflect great credit on himself, his unit, and the United States Army. Next slide. Edgar Lee McWethy. I apologize out there. Uh McWethy, uh he was a Spec 5, Headquarters, Headquarters Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division, uh, from Leadville, Colorado, 
22nd of November, 1944. He's on the panel 22 East, line 32. His start his tour on September 21st, 1966. His incident date was 6-21-67. 22 years old, Ben Den Province, his body was recovered. Uh, see the next picture, and we'll see the citation. Spec 5, uh, Edgar Lee McWethy, Jr., United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, while serving with the 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry Regiment, 1st Cavalry Division, in action against enemy aggressors, forces at Binh Dinh Province, Republic of Vietnam, on 21 June 1967. Serving as a medical aid man with Company B, Spec 5 McWethy, accompanied his platoon to the site of a downed helicopter. Shortly after the platoon established a defensive perimeter around the aircraft, <clears throat> a large enemy force attacked position from three sides with heavy volume of automatic weapon fire and grenades. Next slide. The platoon leader and his radio operator were wounded almost immediately. And Spec 5 uh, McWethy, McWethy rushed across the fire-swept area to the assistance. Although he could not help the mortally wounded radio operator, Spec 5 McWethy's timely first aid enabled the platoon leader to retain command during his critical period, this critical period. Hearing a call for aid, Spec 5 McWethy started across open towards the in injured man, but was wounded in the head and knocked to the ground. He regained his feet and continued, but was hit again, this time in the leg. Struggling onward, despite his wounds, he gained the side of his comrade and treated their injuries. Observing another falling rifleman lying in an exposed position, raked by enemy fire, Spec 5 McWethy moved towards him without hesitation. Although the enemy fire wounded him a third time, Spec 5 McWethy reached his fallen companion. Next slide. Though weakened in extreme pain, Spec uh, five, McEthy gave the wounded man artificial reparation, but suffered a fourth and fatal wound. Through his indomitable courage and complete disregard for his safety and demonstrating concern for his fellow soldier, Specialist Five McEthy inspired the members of the platoon and contributed in great measure to the successful defense of the position and the ultimate route of the enemy forces. Specialist 5 uh, McWethy, profound sense of duty, bravery, and his willingness to accept extraordinary risk in order to help the men of his unit are characteristic of the highest tradition of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, the United States Army. Next slide, please. An engagement on 21 June 1967 was extremely unusual in that it resulted in not one, but two medals of honor. On that date, a platoon from Bravo Company, 1st and 5th Cavalry, was ordered to secure a downed helicopter. The platoon, commanded by 2nd Lieutenant William P. Wagner, established a defensive perimeter around the aircraft, but shortly thereafter, the position was attacked by a large enemy force assaulting from three sides. Although the platoon survived the attack, a third of its men were dead and most of the others wounded. Next slide. The dead were 2nd Lieutenant William P. Wagner, from Longview, Washington, Staff Sergeant Marsh D. Gagnon from North Leeds, Minnesota, Sergeant Thomas A. Johnson, Athens, Alabama, the young man we just talked about, Spec 5, Edgar L. McCarthy, Leadville, Colorado, Medal of Honor, Spec 4, Carmel B. Harvey, Chicago, Illinois, we'll get to his later, Frank J. Costini in California. Robert J. Daughtry, Hamilton, New Jersey. Wellington M. Johnson, New Orleans, LA, Louisiana. Gary L. Kanaga, Wichita, Kansas. PFC G. Osborne, Hanford, California. Next slide. That's a lot, that's a lot of guys, and it have been more if it had not been for my uh, actions there. Uh, Donald Leslie Michael Specialist Four. C Company, 4th Battalion, 503rd Infantry, 173rd uh, Airborne Brigade, United States Army, uh, Lexington, Alabama, 
uh, July 3rd, 1947 to April 8th, 1967. He's on the panel 17E, line 125. You can see him there as a um, uh, his civilian picture. He looks like a, a young man I, I went to high school with, except he's from Alabama. Uh, you see him there with his rifle in front of a hooch. The citation, that's a next slide, citation, please. The president of the United States, we can skip all that. Uh, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Spectful Michael, U.S. Army, distinguished himself while serving with Company C. Spectful Michael was part of a platoon which was moving through an area of suspected enemy activity. While the rest of his platoon stopped to provide security, the squad to which uh, Spectful Michael was assigned moved forward to investigate signs of recent enemy activity. After moving approximately 125 meters, the squad encountered a single Viet Cong soldier. Next slide. When he was fired upon by the squad's machine gun, other Viet Cong opened fire with automatic weapons from a well-concealed bunker to the squad's right front. The volume of enemy fire was so withering as to pin down the entire squad and halt all forward movement. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Spec 4 Michael exposed himself to throw two grenades but failed to eliminate the enemy position. From his position on the left flank, Spec 4 Michael maneuvered forward with two more grenades until he was within 20 meters of the enemy bunker, where he again exposed himself to throw two grenades, which failed to detonate. Undaunted, Spec 4 Michael made his way back to the friendly position to obtain two more grenades. With two grenades in hand, he again started his perilous move towards the enemy in the bunker, which by this time was under intense artillery fire from friendly positions. As he neared the bunker, an enemy soldier attacked him from a concealed position. Next slide. Spec 4 Michael killed him with his rifle, and in spite of the enemy fire and exploding artillery rounds, was successful in destroying the enemy positions. Spec 4 Michael took up pursuit of the remnants of the retreating enemy, when his comrades reached Spec 4 Michael, he had been mortally wounded. His inspiring display of determination and courage saved the lives of many of his comrades and successfully eliminated a destructive enemy force. Spec 4 Michael's actions were in keeping with the highest tradition of military service and reflect their utmost credit upon himself and the United States Army. Next slide. You can see his headstone there, Stuart's Tours, 1966. Uh, six and his incident date was uh, four eight sixty seven. He was nineteen years old. Taney in Providence, and his body was recovered. As you heard. Next slide. We're going to be talking about Gary Lee Miller, first lieutenant, A Company, first battalion, twenty eighth infantry, first infantry division, uh, from Covington, Virginia. Uh, born March 19th, 1947. He is located on the West Wall, 32, line 45. As you can see him there, uh, wearing his official Army uh, glasses and his uniform and his civilian look with his, with his headstone. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let's see. First, uh, First Lieutenant Gary Lee Miller, United States Army Reserve for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving 1st Battalion, 2nd Infantry Regiment, 1st Infantry Division in action against enemy aggressors forces at Binh Duong, Providence, Republic of Vietnam on 16th February, 1969. 1st Lieutenant Miller, Infantry Company A, was serving as a platoon leader at night when his company ambushed a hostile force was broken first. Let me see if I can get that little thing that popped up right there. I don't know whether y'all see it or not, but I, I do. All right, let's see. First Lieutenant Miller, I was serving as platoon leader. At the contact with the enemy, was broken. First Lieutenant Miller led a reconnaissance patrol.
You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.